Are you, are you coming to the tree with a strong upper man? The same murder three. Strange things did happen here, no stranger would it be if we met at midnight in the hanging tree. Coffee. Without it, we would never have had the Industrial Revolution. We'd all be still living in Europe in mud huts. Here in Laredo, we have the Organic Man Coffee Trike. 4501 McPherson, the best coffee on the planet. If you can't get to Laredo, you can order from the Organic Man Coffee Trike dot shop. <clears throat> And welcome to the show. I'm your host, Chris James. And once again, I seem to be having all kinds of weird technical difficulty. Like that. Can't seem to get rid of it. Uh, started off the show about an hour ago, and I'm just now recording. So, I'll figure it out one of these days. I just got an email from Ryan from Perth, Western Australia. Must be the most distant listener I've had so far. I hope y'all are doing okay down under. I don't know what the weather's like since they're on the other side of the planet. It must be the cool season. Oh, what a fun week I've had, besides having technical difficulties with the show. Monday night, a gust of wind brought down a huge limb in my backyard. It landed in amongst my wife's rose bushes. I had to carefully step in and around the bushes while cutting the limb into small enough pieces to haul to the curb. It wasn't just one limb, it was like this whole half of a tree. After working long enough that I'd worked up quite a sweat, I decided to take a break. So I took my dogs to the park so they could have some exercise and, you know, enjoy the day. As we're almost in the park, I heard some woman yelling. I look up, and here comes this big dog. It looked like a pit bull, running straight at my dogs. It grabbed him, and the fight was on. I had both dogs held up in the air trying to get them apart. I felt like I was trying to recreate that painting of Hercules fighting the lion. Pit bull versus poodle. M grabbed my hand, so I was bleeding, and she was bleeding, and Mark was trying to stay out of the way. Finally, the woman drug her dog away, yelling all kinds of things in Spanish. I don't know if she was cursing me or apologizing. It was kind of hard to tell, because I'm still hanging on to a poodle that's trying to get revenge for what had happened. Ugh. We got home along with both dogs, and assessed her wounds. She had a, a puncture wound to the side of her neck that I had to clean up, and then I had to clean my hand. Notice, she got first choice for the first aid. I don't blame Em for biting me, and she was trying to defend herself against a dog that was at least four times her size. I don't blame the attacker, either. Dogs do strange things, and since we don't understand how they think, uh, maybe he saw her as a threat, even though she was a lot smaller than him. Now the woman, next time I hope she keeps a better hold on the leash. Uh, this was the last thing I expected, but then no one expects the Spanish Inquisition. Some of y'all will get that reference. What's up with what I call the $90 scam? I've been getting these emails saying I have a $90 deposit or check or a cash reward or a gift card. And it's always 90 bucks. This is what it said. Weekend's surprise. Thank you for using Verizon Wireless. Your recent purchase has got you eligible for an exclusive reward of $90.
You are one of 10 randomly selected Verizon wireless customers who will receive this reward. You have been rewarded a free reward worth $90. Just click on the button below to claim your reward. I checked with Geico back when I received the first email, just to make sure. You know, I had that slight suspicion it was a scam, but I wanted to make sure because, hey, 90 bucks is 90 bucks. Uh, they said no, I was not due to any check. Uh, uh, the next day I received the exact same email, only this time it said it was from Amazon. Followed by Spectrum Cable and Walgreens. I get one or two of these a day now. Now, I know it's a scam. I just hope that the perpetrators get what's coming to them. I don't know, explosive diarrhea or something. Anyway, I have to thank the guys at Expanded Perspectives for tonight's show. A Cam Hale and Kyle Filson. I was listening to their last show about curses. Well, it was called Cursed. And I heard a bit about how the triangle may have come to be. Uh, this got me to looking into some of the stories surrounding this piece of land in Massachusetts. If you haven't listened to Expanded Perspectives yet, and you like strange things, you should give them a listen. Their show is well done, and they cover a variety of subjects. The Bridgewater Triangle is an area of about 200 square miles in southeastern Massachusetts. Uh, people have had paranormal encounters, such as UFO sightings, poltergeists, orbs, balls of fire, spectral phenomenon, various Bigfoot-type creature sightings, giant snakes, and thunderbirds. The Wapanog Indians called part of the area, which is the Hockamock Swamp, which means the place where spirits dwell. English colonists called it the Devil's Swamp. This swamp is only a tiny part of the entire triangle located near the center of Northern End. The swamp covers about 5,000 acres. There's an 8,000-year-old Indian burial ground. When archaeologists opened some of the graves on Grassy Island, the red ochre within the tombs began to bubble, and then it all disappeared. They took numerous photographs as they were working, and none of the photos were developed. Everything just turned out black. Just across the Tontaine River from Grassy Island is a rock with writing on it. No one knows who carved these inscriptions or what they say. Folks think they might be Indian or maybe Viking writings. Some say the Venetians may have carved the rock. It is called Dighton Rock. The words could be either some form of a curse or maybe even a warning telling people to stay away from the area. In 1781... Count Anton Court de Gibellin of Paris announced that he had fathomed the secrets inscribed on the rock. A Dighton rock commemorated the visit to Massachusetts in the very ancient times of a shipload of seamen from Carthage who lived for a while on Mount Hope Bay. They had established friendly relations with the Indians. The drawings on the rock de Gibellin De, de Gebelin explained, portray the leaders of the expedition consulting an oracle in order to select an auspicious moment for the perilous voyage back to Carthage. I just loved the way some people used to talk. Can't understand it, but I loved it. 1807, Samuel Harris Jr., a Harvard scholar, declared he was able to decipher the rock face carvings as ancient Hebrew. He said the words were Phoenician letters for king, priest, and idol. 1831, Ira Hill, a Maryland schoolteacher, concluded that the rock was engraved in the second month of the tenth year of the reign of King Solomon, 
by an expedition of Tyrians and Jews such as the one described in the Old Testament, 1 Kings 9. And King Solomon made a navy of ships in Ezogunbar, <laughs> and Hiram sent in the navy his servants, a shipman that had knowledge of the sea, with the servants of Solomon. And they came to Ophir and fetched from there gold, 420 talons, and brought it back to King Solomon. A talent was a unit of, me of weight, approximately 80 pounds. The rock is supposed to say that somebody found 33,600 pounds of gold. That's over $58 million. A Metacom, also known as Metacomet, Pometacomet, and King Philip, was a tribal leader of the Pocon Poconocet tribe and the Wapanog nation. When his father, Massasasat, died sometime around 1660 at the age of 81, his oldest son, Wamsutta, became chief. In recognition of becoming chief, Wamsutta decided to change his name, and he asked the Plymouth leaders for an English name. As a result, they renamed him Alexander Poconocet. Alexander asked the English to gave, give his brother Matacom a name as well, for which they chose Philip. 1662, the Plymouth colonists began to suspect that the natives were planning an attack on the colony, and so they arrested Alexander. English law, you get arrested and then you get questioned, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean you're guilty or anything, it's just that's how they took you into custody. It's not like here in the U.S. where they slap on the cuffs and you're under arrest. Uh, in English law, it's you're under arrest when they they tell you, hey, we want to talk to you. So he was arrested, but he wasn't shackled and all that stuff. He was taken to Plymouth to stand trial in order to prove his loyalty to the crown. While under arrest, Alexander pledged his loyalty to the English and was then released. However, on his way home, he died from a disease he had contracted. Rumors began to spread about Wapanog that he had been poisoned by the colonists. A Philip became chief. Well, he sold a whole lot of land to the English over the next nine years. In 1671, rumors of an impending war began to circulate once more. Peace treaties were signed and then broken. Soon folks began shooting back and forth, and the fighting became known as the King Philip War. All this time I thought the King Philip War had something to do with Spain. <coughs> In August 1676, Philip was captured, hanged, drawn, and quartered for treason. A drawn meant he was stretched out between four horses, and quartered meant his body was cut into four pieces. Philip's head and hand were given to an Indian named Alderman as a reward for capturing King Philip. I would much rather have gold or even silver, not body parts. Some of the battles uh, in King Philip's final demise all took place inside the triangle. A large granite outcropping known as Profile Rock is also sometimes called Joshua's Mountain. The rock is 50 feet high and has a striking likeness to a human face. According to the legends of the native Wapanog people, the rock took on the image of Wapanog chief Massosot and is the location where the chief's son, Wamsutta, or Plymouth, had died. The tribe has long held that the rock is a sacred location, and over the years it's been associated with a variety of ghostly phenomenon, such as strange glowing lights, a disembodied voices, orbs of light, and sinister apparitions. Indian legends 
include giant snakes and the Pukwudgies living in and around the swamp. The Wapanog tribe tells stories about how the Pukwudgies, tiny gray goblin-like creatures that inhabit the swampy region of eastern Massachusetts. These creatures live around the swamp and are described as looking like porcupines that walk on two legs with oversized noses, thick fingers and ears. They were tricksters and shapeshifters who would appear and vanish at will. One of their many nasty attributes was a tendency to lure people into the swamp where they became lost and died. Anawan Rock is named for Chief Anawan and is the site where he surrendered to the colonists ending King Philip's War. Legend says that the angry spirits of Chief Anawan's warriors continue to haunt the area, starting spectral fires and the sounds of the ghost dance, which was a dance to reunite the living with the spirits of the dead, can be heard. <clears throat> During the 17th century war between the colonists and the Wapanog and the Narragansett Indians, several Indian warriors leapt to their death from the ledge rather than die at the hands of the English. Some visitors say they've seen ghosts of Native Americans walking in the trees near this cliff. <clears throat> Many years ago, a young man and woman were in love. They would meet secretly at the ledge at night because their families disapproved of their romance. How similar it is to everything today. One night, the woman arrived at the ledge and waited for her boyfriend. She waited all night, but he never arrived. In despair, she threw herself off the ledge to her death in the water below. Her spirit has haunted the ledge ever since. Many people have seen a woman's ghost walking along the top of the ridge, and some have even seen her step off the edge. When she hits the water, she disappears without even leaving a splash. It's like she just fades into the water. Weird phenomena related to human ghosts have been encountered at the site. Glowing lights have been seen in the pond. Many believe these are the souls of the people who died on the ledge. Visitors say when they're standing over the water, they get a sudden feeling of despair. They feel as if life is just too hard and it's, it's not worth the effort of going on. Most manage to brush this off as being just the still water far below. A few can't resist these feelings, they wind up throwing themselves off the edge. The ridge is called Suicide Cliff by many of the locals. A paranormal researcher, Lorne Coleman, gave the area its name in the 70s. Why a triangle? You can place any shape you want over an area of odd occurrences. Calling it the Bridgewater Square sounds like a farmer's market. The Bridgewater Circle makes me think of a dance. Calling it the Bridgewater Triangle brings to mind the Bermuda Triangle, which you should all be familiar with. The first documented report of paranormal activity was made over three centuries ago in 1760. At 10 a.m. May 10, 1760, a sphere of fire was reported to hover over the New England and emit <laughs> hover over New England and emit a light so bright that it cast shadows in the morning sun. The light was seen from Bridgewater and Ruxbury. Why UFOs are attracted to one location is anyone's guess. Trying to think like an alien is beyond our abilities since we don't know why they do all the things they do. No records are around of any sightings until 1908 on Halloween night. Two men were traveling by carriage late at night when they saw another glowing ball of light. These men said inside the bright light was some form of flying ship. They thought it was a balloon, but the bright light ruled this out. 
It wasn't coming from the craft, but encircling it. The light was visible for about 30 minutes. Others came forward to say they had seen this light as well. It was recorded in the newspapers, otherwise we wouldn't know anything about it. How many sightings were made between 1760 and 1908, we may never know. First, there has to be something to, to be seen. Then you have to have somebody there that sees it. They have to make a written record that will last until today so we can find it. A researcher has to go looking and then pass the information on to others. Lots of moving parts. In the summer of 1941, a 15-year-old was working in a field when he saw three UFOs. He'd taken a few minutes to stretch and wipe his face when he saw a flash of sunlight. It was being reflected off of something high overhead. The boy looked closer and he saw three objects flying towards him. They looked cigar-shaped and were made of some kind of a shiny metal. They were flying one in front of the other, making some odd movements. The cigar in front would drop down lower than the others. Then the object behind it would shoot past and drop down lower than the first UFO. The boy said it looked like they were playing leapfrog with each other. <clears throat> he watched these flying objects for about 30 seconds as they made their way towards the horizon. They were absolutely quiet and there was no smoke or any kind of exhaust coming from them. 1978, Ronald Reagan was governor of California. He was flying over the triangle, passing right over the suicide cliff when a UFO was spotted trailing them. Reagan told the pilot, Air Force Colonel Bill Painter, to circle around and get a better look at the UFO. The pilot tried to get a closer look, but the unknown object would suddenly make sharp course changes. The UFO then made a 45-degree turn and accelerated beyond anything a plane could have done. Once on the ground, Reagan related the incident to Norman Miller, who was the Washington bureau chief for the Wall Street Journal. In 1979, two reporters were heading to the Taunton Dog Track to give a live broadcast. A Taunton is the center of the triangle. They worked for a radio station, so they didn't have any cameras. As they were pulling off 44, they spotted a bright light in the sky. It got both of their attention, so they stopped to try and figure out what it was. The light turned out to be on the bottom of a huge five-sided craft that was quietly flying overhead. The shape was similar to home plate in a baseball diamond. It looked black against the night sky with what looked like a searchlight or a beam coming from the front under the point. It hovered over a field for several minutes as the two reporters gawked at it. Once the UFO flew away, the two men had to get to the dog track and do their jobs. They kept the story to themselves, only announcing the race. While not on the air, they talked about what they had seen and what they thought it might be. For weeks after this event, reports began to come in from all around the Triangle. People had called into the local police station saying they had seen a huge flying craft with a bright light on it. Once others had come forward, the two reporters gave their accounts of the UFO sighting as well. November 1997, a police officer on a night shift in the Triangle saw a very large UFO with three white and two red star-like lights. December 10, 1998, a witness near Route 44 in Middleborough saw a strange brightly lit craft with numerous red, green, and white lights maneuvering over Ossawampset Pond. <clears throat> Then, in the summer of 1999, a 20-year-old George LaCase saw a UFO he stated. 
It was moving all around. It was moving in ways planes don't move. March 20th, 2013, a large triangle-shaped UFO was seen at 2 p.m. The craft was moving back and forth at a high speed. It was over the Bridgeport State University. After zigging and zagging back and forth for a few minutes, the craft took off at an incredible rate, vanishing from sight. The witness made a report to the National UFO Reporting Center. New Fork has been doing the Air Force's job since 1969. September 11, 2013, a light was seen moving through the air east of Bridgewater. At first, it looked like a helicopter, but it was way too high and bright. Had it been a chopper, the light wouldn't have been so big and bright. On the 14th, five large red orbs were seen flying in a square formation. As the formation was flying, a new orb would appear every few seconds. The formation became two squares, one on top of the other and it just kept heading south. November 20th, six bright orange lights were seen over Bridgewater. This was at about 6.45 p.m. The witness had a video camera and was able to catch the lights right next to the university. A skeptics tried to say the orbs were simply a NASA launch from Wallops Island. The Minotaur rocket did launch that day, only it was two hours after the video was made. Also, the rocket made one long trail through the sky, whereas the video shows six orbs with no trails coming from them. The naysayers immediately changed their story, saying that it was Chinese lanterns. The orbs moved back and forth in such a manner they were not being blown by the wind. There have also been reports of black helicopters flying in and out of the triangle. They've heard these for years. Just being painted black doesn't make them odd. Not having any form of identification or any running lights is what catches people's attention. Local resident Mary Lou Jones reported hearing a very loud helicopter noise in Rehoboth in June 25, 2002. There were no helicopters anywhere in the air when the, she could hear the noise. She was able to track down and interview other witnesses who told her that mysterious helicopters equipped with spotlights were seen flying over Palmer River School on the north side of Route 44. A local farmer reported two black helicopters with spotlights were flying in formation above the trees. The choppers had come from the southeast from Mount Hope Bay in Swansea. Black helicopters have been seen in areas where cattle mutilation take place. The Bridgewater Triangle has had several animal mutilation cases over the years. Various incidents of animal mutilation have been reported, particularly in Freetown and Fall River, where local police were called to investigate mutilated animals believed to be the works of a cult. Two specific incidents in 1998 were reported, one in which an, a single adult cow was found butchered in the woods, the other in which a group of calves were discovered in a clearing, grotesquely mutilated and placed in some kind of a ritualistic pattern. Uh, just on the southwest end of the triangle, near Raboth, Rehoboth, folks are seeing a red-headed hitchhiker. Anyone who encounters this man says he's not human. Either a spirit or a ghost. The hitchhiker has been seen on 44 east of town. He's about six feet tall, wearing a plaid shirt and jeans. Sometimes he's dressed very neatly, while other times he looks like he's been rolling in the dirt. Everybody agrees he has red hair and a beard. 
The witnesses who encounter this ghost are traveling on a stretch of Route 44 that runs from Rehoboth to Seekonk. Most sightings happen around 10 p.m. or just before sunup. One witness was driving along the road when he glanced to the passenger window. The red-headed spirit was looking in the window. His face was pressed right up against the glass. Shocked by what he saw, the driver pulled to the side and stopped. There was nobody there and no sign of him anywhere around. It took the driver several minutes to get his heart rate down enough to continue driving. Another man was driving along the road when he spotted a man hitchhiking up ahead. Back then it was common to stop and pick up folks needing a ride. The driver stopped and offered a lift. The red-headed man got into the car and they began to drive. The driver asked where his passenger was headed, but the redhead didn't say anything. Instead, he just stared at him, smiling. The driver got unnerved and finally pulled over and told the passenger it was time to get out. Still smiling, the passenger sat there for a few seconds and then he faded from sight. A female was driving along the stretch of road when the redhead appeared right in front of her car. The car went over him. The driver was shocked, thinking she had just run someone over. She slammed on the brakes and jumped from her car. The road was clear. She looked back and forth, and then she looked in the grass on both sides. Nothing. She even looked under her car. This was when she realized that the car struck the man. He hadn't felt anything. There was no bump or crash. The front of the car was undamaged. From out of nowhere, the sound of laughter came to her. Not happy laughter, but something close to being evil. She practically dove into the car. The sound of laughter was still with her. She put the car in drive and started on her way when the man appeared once again right in front of her. The car passed over the guy, but the driver only opened the window and leaned out a little bit just to make sure there was nobody there. The laughter was coming from the darkness all around. Now, this was enough, so she gave it the gas and got out of there. To this day, she never drives this area alone. It's all she can do to even drive at night. A couple were driving through the area at about 10 p.m. when their car stalled. Now, this was long before cell phones, so the man told his wife he was going to look for a phone to call somebody and he'd be right back. As he was walking along the road looking for anywhere with a phone, he spotted someone on the side of the road. The person looked like a homeless guy with red hair and a beard. The driver asked if this man knew of any phones in the area. It used to be common to have phone booths along roadways, usually at grocery stores and gas stations. When's the last time you saw a phone booth? Asking several times, the driver began to think there was something weird about this redhead. He even asked the guy if he was okay. In response, all the redhead did was stare back with a smile. As he watched, the redhead's face began to twist into an ugly grimace. The eyes rolled back, showing only white. The driver decided he'd best return to the car and his wife. As he hurried along the roadside, he began to hear laughter. The sound was coming from where he'd seen the redhead, but then it switched locations and it was coming from the trees right beside him. The laughter followed him all the way back to the car. At the car, the driver found his wife standing by the side of the road. She was in a very bad state. She was crying and looked as if she was scared beyond belief. 
asking what was wrong. The wife told him as soon as he'd left, she'd turned on the radio to pass the time. As she was listening to a song, a voice came out of nowhere. At first, she thought it was just the DJ, but the voice called her by name. This got her full attention. The voice began to make fun of her, saying all kinds of unfriendly things. She turned the radio off, but the voice was still there. She opened the door and got out to get away from the mocking voice. She stood there, too frightened to get back in until her husband got back. The couple waited there in the dark until another car came along and stopped to help him out. A very odd spirit. He changes his clothes from time to time, but he always has red hair and a beard. He's always seen around ten at night or four to five in the morning. Always in the same small area, a five-mile stretch of road right on the edge of the Bridgewater Triangle. The Freetown Fall River State Forest, which is within the trial, tri triangle, within the triangle, has been the site of several gruesome murders linked to admitted Satanists or otherwise consistent with Satanic rituals. Local graves have been disturbed with skulls stolen. In some cases, the skulls are later found in the Freetown Forest. Sites have been found with evidence of ritualistic animal sacrifice. Since the 1980s, many instances of sacrificed cattle and goats have been investigated or otherwise recorded by the Freetown Police. The Freetown Fall River State Forest is located in the southeast corner of the Triangle. This is where satanic rituals were happening in 1979 and in 1980. It is nicknamed the Cursed Forest of Massachusetts. One of the earliest recorded murders in the forest happened in November 1978. The body of a 15-year-old Mary Lou Arruda was found tied to a tree in the woods. The girl had been abducted two months prior. James M. Keeter was arrested and convicted for the kidnapping and murder. Ever, even once the case was closed, many said Aruda had been a victim of a satanic cult. The body of another victim was found October 13, 1979. The victim was a 17-year-old prostitute, Doreen Levesque. As she was found with her wrists bound with fishing line, and she had been tortured and then stabbed in the head several times. The police suspected one of her many clients had committed the murder, but that wasn't the case. As it turned out, Doreen had been a member of a cult that practiced rituals in the forest. As the authorities looked into the case, they began to believe a 26-year-old named Carl Drew, who was also Doreen's pimp, had performed some kind of a satanic ritual involving the murder. Karen Marsden, who also worked for Carl, told the police she believed Carl was the devil and had sacrificed Doreen. The police questioned Carl but could never build a case against him. The case was written off as just another prostitute who died from misadventure. Another prostitute, 22-year-old Barbara Raposa, worked around the same area as Doreen, Doreen Levesque, as she was reported missing by her boyfriend, Andy Maltias. Maltias was well known by the police as being a pedophile, a rapist, a sexual sadist, and a pimp. He'd had several girls working for him, and all of them said he was a very strange person. None of them knew anything about him. His life was a mystery to everyone. At some point in his life, Maltias had a change of heart, and he claimed to have become a devout Christian. Years before the murder was discovered, Maltias had been a Satanist along with Barbara. 
During questioning, he told authorities he believed the cult was responsible for her disappearance. Karen Marston told the police Carl Drew had organized the prostitutes into a group as a satanic coven. She and another prostitute, Carol Fletcher, told the police the cult held their nocturnal gatherings in the Freetown State Forest. And Marsden was afraid her body was going to be dumped in the woods after she was murdered. Her soul was going to be offered to Satan for talking to the police. Uh, Carl Drew wasn't the only dangerous member of the cult. Karen Marston's 17-year-old friend, Robin Murphy, was known for becoming violent at the drop of a hat. Robin told the police it had been Andy Maltias who had killed Barbara Raposa in a cult ritual. He had chosen her because he suspected she was cheating on him. Marsden said she had been with them on the night of the murder. Maltias and Raposa started arguing while driving through the forest. He'd pulled over, beat her to death, and left the body in the brush. Murphy claimed she didn't report him sooner, fearing retribution. Her testimony was full of holes, but Maltias was already known as being a huge problem, so her testimony was enough to get him behind bars. Robin Murphy claimed to be present during the Levesque murder. She said her killing had been an offering to Satan and Carl Drew was responsible. Levesque wanted to start working on her own and leave the cult, and Drew didn't want to lose her and the money she was bringing in. Murphy said she didn't see the murder, but heard everything as it happened. Murphy's testimony wasn't plausible, as her description didn't match with any of the evidence. A Karen Marsden's skull was found in the forest. Former prostitute Maureen Sprada contacted the police and told them Robin Murphy was the murderer. As she had told Karen all about what had happened during a phone conversation. During her interrogation, Murphy confessed to the murder, saying Marston had become too much of a liability, and Murphy thought she was a snitch with the police. Robin Murphy told the authorities, Marston's death was a ritual of stoning, snapping her neck and then slitting her throat. Carl Drew was there during the murder and had been speaking in some kind of a weird language and offering Karen's soul to Satan. The head had been removed and the body was burned and buried in the woods. Marine Sprada also told the police black mass gatherings took place in the forest. She said she didn't know anything about human sacrifice, but she did say that goats and other animals were used during the ceremonies. Their blood was used in a form of bizarre baptism as it was poured over the heads of the attendees. Robin Murphy received a life sentence with the possibility of parole. She was released in 2004, but violated her parole and was returned to prison in 2007. Carl Drew is currently serving a life sentence with no possibility of parole. He's filed several appeals seeking a new trial, claiming he was never involved with any cult. So far, he's still locked up. Well over a dozen confirmed murders have been investigated in the forest from 1978 to 1988. Uh, during one investigation, the police discovered an underground bunker. It was filled with all manner of torture devices. Someone had built this underground structure to use it for some nasty purposes. No one has ever been arrested in connection with this hidden place. Bigfoot has been seen in the Triangle for years. The local Indians used to tell about a hair-covered person who lived in the area around the swamp. It was their policy, don't bother the hairy giant and he won't bother them. 
The Indians considered this creature to be a man that just looked different and lived in the woods. 1978, Joe DeAndra Andrade was in the woods enjoying nature. As he was passing clay banks, he thought he heard somebody in the bushes nearby. He was looking through the trees when he saw this huge, hair-covered man walking towards him. The man looked more ape-like than human, but it walked like a man. Joe was somewhat distraught not knowing what this creature might do, so he took off running as fast as he could, not stopping until he found a road. Once he'd collected himself, Joe managed to walk back to the last place he'd seen the ape man. He couldn't find any sign on the ground, but everything was covered in leaf litter. John Baker was in the Hockamock Swamp when he heard something as he was out on his canoe laying muskrat traps. A baker reported hearing something crashing through the woods and then witnessed a huge hairy creature wading into the water. It passed within a few yards of his canoe. The creature was described as being human-like, covered in hair, and it had a nasty smell. <clears throat> On July 14, 2009, a couple were driving from New Bedford to Freetown. Just inside the triangle, the woman spotted what looked like a man crouching in the brush in the middle of the highway. The man stood up, and she could see he was covered from head to foot in dark brown hair. She screamed, and the driver looked over to see what she was screaming about. The creature made a turn and began moving towards the trees. It moved with fluid movements like a man, with the body and the face of an ape. The driver stopped and turned around, wanting to get a better look. Once back where the creature had been spotted, they didn't see it again. They contacted the police to file a report of someone running around in the median of the highway. The dispatcher told them they had received numerous reports of someone who looked like they were wearing a full-length fur coat. The state police went to investigate, but they found nothing. <clears throat> Bigfoot-type creatures have been seen in Hockamock Swamp as well. In 1970, several witnesses saw a hairy seven-foot-tall animal which stood on its hind legs. But when it knew that it was being observed, it got down on all fours to run away. As several Bigfoot reports, the creature has been seen running on all fours. The sighting was classified as being a bear, although there are no bears in this area. Later that same year, two police officers were sitting in their cruiser when they felt something pick up the rear of the patrol car. The officers shined a spotlight towards the rear bumper, trying to see what was messing with their vehicle. As it was running away, the officers caught a glimpse of it. It resembled a bear, though none was ever found in the area. The idea of a bear lifting up a car is beyond me. I've heard of them ripping out the interiors, but never trying to lift them. As more reports came in about a hairy creature that ran like a bear, but could walk on its hind legs like a man, the creature became known as the Hockamock Monster. A local resident said they saw the Hockamock Monster in the winter of 1978. He described the creature as being at least six feet tall, weighing about 400 pounds and covered with dark brownish hair. Another Bigfoot sighting around the same time was reported by a woman who saw a tall, bipedal creature in her garden one night. It was eating a pumpkin. It had dark hair and reddish eyes. When it noticed her, it ran off into the woods, taking the pumpkin with it. Along with the Bigfoot sightings, people have reported seeing thunderbirds flying around. 
These pterodactyl-like creatures are said to have a wingspan of 12 feet. They've been seen in and around Taunton and Hockamock Swamp. A few people have encountered phantom dogs with glowing red eyes. These are also known as hellhounds. These creatures are supposed to be there to guard some unknown valuables hidden away by unsavory beings. On occasion, hellhounds have been found in the area where undead creatures are either buried or resting. Uh, things like vampires and elementals. In 1976 in Abington, a resident reported seeing a large phantom dog with red eyes that had killed two of its ponies. The witness was the pony's owners who said the beast ripped their throats out. It was almost as big as both ponies themselves. Abington police responded to the scene of the attack, and they spotted the beast running through the woods. The officer fired his weapon at it with no effect. He said the bullets seemed to go right through this giant dog without doing any harm. Abington is at the far north end of the Triangle. If you look at a map of the Bridgewater Triangle, you'll notice that Taunton is in the middle. I wonder why Lorne Coleman didn't call it the Taunton Triangle. I tried to get a hold of him as I was putting this show together, but he's a lot busier than I am, and I don't have any spare time, so I imagine he has to use time from next week in order to get things done. Now, I have talked to... Uh, Lorne Coleman on several occasions. I've met him in an elevator in Tyler, Texas, of all places. Knew the man for all of 30 seconds when he took me around and introduced me to all of the other uh, cryptid researchers that were in the hotel. He acted like I was his best friend on the whole planet, which I was like, yeah, I've known Lorne for about a minute now. <laughs> He's a very nice person. Anyway, getting back to the story. Built in 1854, Taunton State Hospital was called the State Lunatic Hospital at Taunton. A newer, more modern buildings were added to the 154-acre parcel of land. The original building was called Kirk Bridge Building. It remained standing for over 150 years. Over the years, the structure was rebuilt and remodeled, but it was almost always used as a hospital. What in the world was that? Anyway, uh, from the day it was first opened, the hospital was home to some of the worst killers in the area. A someone society didn't want to deal with was sent to the hospital. Most were never allowed to leave. Jane Toppin was a nurse at the Cambridge Hospital. During her time there, she experimented on patients using various drugs to see what would happen. In addition to her known medically induced deaths, Jane also claimed more victims than any other female serial killer. After her arrest, she confessed to murdering 31 patients. She remained at the Taunton Insane Asylum until her death in 1938. Lizzie Borden, the young woman accused of murdering her father and stepmother with an axe, also spent time in the Taunton Hospital. Not all the killers were patients. Some of them were the staff. As the years went by, rumors of bizarre doings going on in the basement began to come out. Some of the less challenged patients told of people being taken downstairs to the basement never to return. The story was some of the staff were conducting weird experiments on patients that nobody would ever miss. Other stories said the staff were performing satanic rituals using some of the patients for sacrifices. A lot of people thought this was just rantings of those with issues. Just before the hospital closed in 1975, some records turned up 
mentioning odd things being done late at night in the base- basement. Mostly just patients that would suddenly go missing or die under mysterious circumstances. None of the records ever actually said a patient was sacrificed to anyone, but the number of unexplained deaths while in the care of the same few staff members, combined with some of the staff having less than decent reputations, has kept the stories alive. People who visited the hospital said they had an overwhelming sense of dread and paranoia when going downstairs to the basement. Some of the staff said their co-workers were really strange and it was possible they were doing things to the patients far beyond any kind of medical treatment. Satanists are not all teenagers with nothing better to do. Colonel Michael Aquino was in the U.S. Army Military Intelligence, specializing in psychological warfare. He was also a Satanist involved in the kidnapping and murder of children. All 900 witnesses who made statements against Aquino were determined to be unreliable. That's an awful lot of unreliable witnesses all saying the same thing. In 1990, the Taunton State Hospital main building began to collapse. Then, a fire took down most of the rest in 2009. The Bridgewater Triangle sounds like an interesting place to visit. You can look for UFOs, cryptids, ghosts, or just enjoy the scenery. You might want to watch your step as you hike the trails. It would ruin your vacation if you wound up stumbling on some undiscovered dead body. It could happen just about any hiking trail, but the triangle sounds like it would be far more likely. If I lived near such a place, I'd wind up spending all my time looking for strange things and never get any work done. What other areas have so many weird sightings and occurrences? Well, how about Skinwalker Ranch? People see UFOs, Bigfoot-type creatures, and ghosts all the time on that ranch in Utah. There's the Alaska Triangle, one of the biggest areas where weird things happen on a regular basis. These areas are not true triangles. The sides are not straight lines. If you saw the actual boundaries of these locations drawn on a map, you'd think somebody was having DTs. The strange things that happen in these areas are witnessed outside the three-sided shapes drawn on the map. There are no clearly defined insides or outsides. You can have an experience miles away from any one of these triangles. Hope you enjoyed tonight's show. If you did, spread the word. Let other people know what they're missing. If you want to hear the archives and you're listening on some other podcast platform, you can find all the archives going back to, what was it, 2015 when I started this thing? Or was it 16? Can't even remember. It's been so long. But if you'd like to hear all of the archives, you can find them on iHeartRadio. Or you can listen on Spreaker if you're listening on the computer, or you can find them all on YouTube. If you have a story you'd like to hear on the show or something you'd like me to look into, or if you have a story you'd like me to put in my next book, anything to do with UFOs, cryptid-type creatures, or ghosts, uh, send me an email and I'll put it in my next book. You can contact me at Strange things at arcanasa.com. And if you just want to let me know where in the world you are, so I can kind of figure out where all my listeners are, send me an email and I'll maybe mention you on the show or something. Anyway, until next Saturday, this is Chris James for Strange Things. Are you, are you coming to the tree? With a strong upper man, the same murder three.
Strange things did happen here, no stranger would it be If we met at midnight in that hanging tree